Hello everybody! My name is Rachel and welcome to another weekly reading wrap-up. I read quite a few works this past week, but most of them were very, very short, so we'll see how long this wrap-up ends up being. There's only so much I can say about collections of funny comics. <laughs> so let's get into it. Uh, these are in no particular order, by the way. I kind of forgot which order I read these things in. Um, so first up is the only novel that I finished this past week. It is The Continuous Catherine Mortenhoe by D.G. Compton. This is a science fiction novel from the 1970s that kind of explores the impact of reality television before that was a thing, actually. Um, so it follows a woman named Catherine Mortenhoe, who has just been told that she has a fatal illness. She is neurologically um, falling apart, basically, and she's got four weeks left to live. Now, in this future, people just don't die of incurable illnesses anymore, so um, it's quite a sensation that she is going to die. And a media company is basically hounding her throughout the book, attempting to make a program detailing the last weeks of her life and her death to broadcast it to the masses. And it's really about, I think, the invasion of her privacy, the invasion of her dignity in dying, um, because her reaction to this is, oh my god, I've got four weeks left to live, I'm going to live. <laughs> and it kind of like her real self comes out. And then you just see how the, the situation and the publicity, all the money to be made from it, just how, how it changes the behavior of everyone around her. I think there, there are two interesting things about the story to me. I mean, number one, it's just, it's a really interesting story, and I think the point that it's making is um, e extremely relevant to today. I mean, this, this being before reality television really was a thing, and yet it describes it so well. <laughs> the, the vulgarity of it, how reality gets twisted into the fictional story that the producers want to tell, how you don't really see the real person. There's nothing real about reality television. It's all in here. For me, though, there were two things that kind of stuck out about it. One is that I don't think this was written with this intent, but the the person at the heart of the story is a woman. This being written in the 1970s, um, it it's really hard to read in some places where you can just feel that paternalistic tone that all the other characters use with her. Um, she's just this silly little woman who doesn't know herself. Of course she just should just do what her male doctor tells her. She should just do what her husband tells her. She should believe all the men who want to cut deals with her. So it's, it's that sort of thing. Um, and I found that uncomfortable, just the tone of how she is spoken to. Um, there are a couple of other women in the story who are also spoken to that way. There's like one woman, she's the ex-wife of somebody, although everybody always refers to her as his wife. She's not his wife anymore. Um, and she meets his boss, and his boss literally just calls her my dear the entire time. I'm like, wow. <laughs> crossing a boundary there. Um, so I think they, that adds something else, like this uncomfortable twist of the story, just like what all these men are trying to do to this woman who just wants to have some peace and privacy to live out her final days. Uh, but like I said, I don't, I don't think that that layer was necessarily intentional when this was written. I could be wrong though. The other thing that I found really interesting about this is um, the portrayal of Catherine's relationship with her husband is, is, of course, that whole thing about how illness and difficult times and publicity and scrutiny, it puts um, a real pressure on a relationship. And you see how they thought they were happy, they thought they had this stable functioning relationship and they were going to get through things together, but then the reality sinks in about who they really are and what the basis of their relationship really was. Um, I got the sense that they did genuinely care for each other, but her husband was 
too wishy-washy and spineless. Like on the one hand, he's saying, I love you, I'm gonna take care of you, we should go away and have privacy and, and have a vacation for, for the rest of your life, I'll be there for you. But at the same time, he's going behind her back to talk to the media companies and sign contracts and lying to her. <laughs> and he manages to justify it all to himself. And she wants to take care of him, like she wants to have money to take care of him at the same time that she starts to hate him. <laughs> So it's just, I think that is also quite realistic. I think even the strongest of relationships would really feel the strain of this sort of uh, situation. So yeah, there's a lot of really interesting stuff to get into with this book. Um, I'm sure I could ramble on about it a lot longer. Um, I had never heard of either this book or this author before I found it in the SF Masterworks line. And I would definitely say that it's one of those sort of hidden gems in the SF Masterworks. Um, it's worth picking up even if you've never heard it, of it before. Um, the topic is interesting, the writing is quite strong, and it does have a little bit of a, a vulgar streak to it, I will say. I enjoyed the style of this, but it the, the things that people say sometimes, the things that they do, um, it's realistic and yet on that edge of just being a little bit too crude. <laughs> but still quite good. Next up, I read The Science of Herself by Karen Joy Fowler. This is a little collection from PM Press. It contains a couple of stories, an interview with the author, and an essay. Overall, I thought this was okay. I think that Fowler's work has never really jived with me because it kind it's kind of more in the literary camp than in the speculative fiction camp, and yet her stories often contain SFF-like elements or um, so, somewhere in here, I think in the interview she says that she was once told that while she, like, she writes like a literary fiction author, she thinks like an SFF author, which I think is true. Um, so yeah, this was overall just kind of okay. Um, two stories in this I thought were relatively interesting. Um, the, there's another one which I find incredibly depressing, The Pelican Bar. It's about a teenage girl who is severely abused at a boarding school that her parents sent her to. And I, I know I've read it somewhere before because it was very familiar and it just, it left me feeling very depressed. Um, and then the essay in this was, I, I feel like it was very short and half-baked and didn't get anything out of it. So in general, th this was just all right. I kind of was expecting more, but now I realize that Fowler's style just maybe isn't for me. Next up is The Employees by Olga Ravin. This is translated by Martin Aiken. I read this because it is currently a nominee for the Ursula K. Le Guin Prize. This is the inaugural year for that prize. Um, it's a weird one. <laughs> so it's a pretty short novella that um, it takes place on a spaceship uh, that has discovered like another planet and the crew are split between humans and humanoids. Humans are like people born of other people and then the humanoids are synthetic but appear like other humans. Um, and it's, it's organized as these um, statements, like this jumble of statements from the crew that kind of follows the events as tensions arise between humans and humanoids on the ship. They come in conflict with each other, but at the same time, um, the crew are talking about these objects that they have taken from a planet they found and describing like their relationships with these objects that affect them in very strange ways, affect them emotionally or that have very distinct smells or something. Um, it was very weird. I'm not sure why it had to be presented in such a vague and odd way <laughs> but also I, I don't I don't like um, monologuing statements in my in my stories I don't like reading something that's just one half of an interview I guess I like I like seeing the dialogue um, so it was strange and yet kind of compelling to read. I, I mean, I wanted to finish it. I wanted to know what was gonna happen next, but I didn't, I felt like I had to work really, really hard to figure out what was going on for not much of a payoff. But yeah, it was definitely a curiosity. <laughs> next, I read two comics collections by Sarah Anderson. 
Oddball, which is the latest Sarah's Scribbles collection, and then Cryptid Club, which is the same like style as um, Sarah's Scribbles, but all about cryptids like Mothman and stuff like that. Um, I have read almost all of these comics multiple times online uh, because I, I follow San Sarah Anderson on multiple platforms. Um, so I read both of these in one morning and had a really good laugh. I loved both of them immensely. I gave them both five stars. They're, they're excellent. So I I highly recommend them. You've probably seen a lot of these comics yourself if you've been anywhere online. <laughs> Next is Introducing Mr. Winterborn by Joanna Chambers. This is a very, very short um, queer romance novella about Mr. Winterborn, a young gentleman who is asked by his father to kind of squire around a wealthy man um, whose brother is marrying Winterborn's sister. Um, they have a very poor first impression. There are tensions between their families, um, but throughout the course of a day they come to like each other a lot more and fall into bed together. Um, this was a random read. I quite enjoyed it. I read most of it at 3 a.m. because I woke up and I couldn't get back to sleep. <laughs> don't do that very often, but it was like 60 pages long. Um, I quite enjoyed this. I don't usually pick up romance novellas because I don't think it's enough time to really develop a realistic, enjoyable, and satisfying relationship, but this worked very well, so I, I might actually continue with the series. I think there are a couple more novellas. And then lastly, uh, one of my favorite reads of this past week is Mamo by Sass Millage. This is a like mini series comic. I don't think there's going to be any more of it. Um, it is a like young adult fantasy comic about um, a young woman in a village that's uh, been suffering from essentially magical neglect. Um, the boundaries of the village haven't been cared for since their local witch died. The fae are playing tricks on everybody. And she's trying to find the new witch of the village, this young woman who has come back and is asking her to help them um, solve the problems and set everything to rights. And it turns out to be this kind of this quest around the village to figure out exactly what's gone wrong and how it relates to the death of the previous witch and there's also a tiny bit of like a sapphic romance by the end of it. I'm not doing this book justice. This was a really good read. I adored the artwork. I loved the color palette. So it was just beautiful to look at, but it was also just this really good solid story told well and it yeah, I'm really glad that it was kind of a one shot. I'm, I'm glad that it wasn't drawn out over many, many episodes because it was pretty much perfect just the way it is. So it was another five star read from this past week and I highly recommend it. So there you go. And I think that is everything. That That is everything. I still have like a bazillion other books on the go and hopefully I will finish a couple more of them this coming week. We will see. Uh, but for right now, I feel like I've suddenly entered into a like, comics binge? <laughs> comics and novellas. I just suddenly want to read a whole bunch of short things that have been sitting on my TBR for a while. So um, hopefully I'll have another good batch of things to talk about next week. So until then, happy reading and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.